All right, thanks a lot and thanks for coming. Uh, this ought to be a very interesting uh, symposium. Uh, not being a, a neuroscientist uh, myself, uh, you might wonder why I'm organizing this um, uh, symposium. Well, I've spent my life producing models, and these models of cognition and behavior that I'm working on are presumably the target of what the brain does when it produces its thing. So that's going to be the reason that I thought this would be a good idea, among others. And uh, that's why I ended up being an organizer <coughs> of, the, uh, of the symposium. OK, so you're going to hear a number of talks intending to bridge the gap between the uh, sort of neural mechanisms in our brains and the processes that produce uh, um, cognition and behavior. Uh, many of the talks are going to present models. And um, a number will be uh, somewhat technical, I imagine. Um, but this talk is a little different. I am going to just provide some background and the motivation for the uh, colloquium. And I'll describe in an informal way a few of the key issues <coughs> that those interested in bridging this uh, brain-mind divide have to face. Um, but before doing that, I figure as long as I'm here, I can use the opportunity to invite you all to the summer conference, the interdisciplinary conference I run every year, which this is this year's uh, face page of the conference. Some of you have been to these. Uh, this one's in, um, going to be in June in uh, Austria. Next year, we're going to be in Chamonix, France in June. And uh, this runs every year and moves around every year to different places. And it uh, doesn't require invitations, and it's um, uh, you're all invited, any or all of you who'd like to come. You can look at the website. It's the website you can find in Google under ASIC space whatever year. So I just wanted to mention that. That's the most important part of my talk. <laughs> OK, now I want to start by uh, beginning with a subject that seems a little distant from the colloquium at first, artificial intelligence, AI. <clears throat> now. Machine learning, of course, has produced enormous successes that we all see and that we use every day. Uh, they, they usually are labeled uh, AI or artificial intelligence. Um, and you see, we've used these things in one way or another all the time. Uh, speech recognition, speech to text, uh, face identification, object classification, search engines, automatic labeling, language translation, various games that uh, you've seen a lot of, of publicity about. <clears throat> Advertising, of course, um, robotic construction, robotic surgery, um, picture and scene labeling, and on and on and on. And these are things that uh, we all are using these days. And we haven't yet seen self-driving cars and things like that. But who knows? That <laughs> may come down the road eventually. Uh, but then we must ask, is artificial intelligence intelligent? And um, or what is it that these algorithms are doing so successfully? Um, and I think there never is a clearer definition of what intelligence means, of course. It means different things to different people. <clears throat> There's been a lot of claims about uh, these systems being intelligent over the years, people like Minsky and Legg and Kurzweil, <clears throat> and many claims to the contrary, uh, Kapur and Marcus and Melanie Mitchell and on and on. So there's been a lot of argumentation, partly due to the fact that we don't have a clear definition of what intelligence means. Um, <clears throat> whatever it is, <coughs> excuse me, whatever it is, I don't think any of the current machine learning algorithms come close to most people's idea of human intelligence. Um, just to give a trivial example, but it captures the idea, a computer can calculate pi squared to 20 decimal places very carefully, very quickly. But uh, few would think that is a sign of intelligence, just because it can calculate well. To me, this is the same idea is true of all the other algorithms that are presently in use. Even when the size and complexity of some of these deep learning algorithms um, makes it hard to understand how they're working. So here's a deep learning, a generic form of some deep learning feed-forward network that uh, does scene classification. Um, it does a great job of classifying the scenes and the objects, say the objects and the scenes and so on. But I think you could argue it doesn't really understand the scenes it's seeing. It's just using the pixel matching and so on 
to figure out, and, and a large amount of training uh, data to figure out what the objects in the scene are, but it doesn't really understand what it's looking at or what it means. Um, <clears throat> I think the problem is understand, and then the question is, what does it mean to understand? What, what would it mean for a, uh, um, a, an algorithm to understand something? Well, what does it mean for humans to understand something? So let's imagine you have a text statement. The steel ball fell onto the glass top table, it broke. Okay, well, we have no trouble understanding that, nor what the reference of it is. Um, we don't think that it was the steel ball that broke. <laughs> we think it's the glass top table. Um, a computer might or might not, an algorithm might or might not be able to know the correct reference for it, although occasionally some of them have trouble. Um, the, um, but how, when humans, how do, how do humans understand something like this? This is very reminiscent of the same things that Rebecca Sachs was uh, telling us last night. Humans form a mental model of the situation described by the sentences, sort of a, a uh, mental simulation. We have an idea when we hear that sentence of a moving picture of a steel wall falling from above onto a glass surface and shattering it. Um, and uh, such a simulation is probably what is meant by understanding, what we think of as understanding and what we mean by it. So understanding is sort of, a good part of understanding is our construction of a simulation of a real, of a, of a scenario in an environment. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that brings us to the title and the uh, theme of this colloquium, The Brain Produces Mind by Modeling. And the longer title, which we was told was too long to be used, The Brain Produces Mind by Modeling the Self, the Body, the Environment, Other Agents, and Their Interactions. That was a bit clumsy. <clears throat> but, um, and of course, Rebecca, Rebecca Sachs reminded and showed us last night that a critical part of what is modeled are the thinking processes of the other agents as well that should be included in this uh, uh, system. Okay. Uh, these models are not veridical. They're not, uh, they don't uh, match exactly what the senses provide us from the environment, but they're useful models. Sometimes they're consciously aware of the individual and sometimes not so. Um, one example is visual perception. So when I look at this room or you look at the scene, you think you see about this much, you know, as sort of the 150 degrees of the visual field. We think we're seeing, but do we see that? Not actually at all. So here's an example of acuity um, in the fovea in terms of degrees of visual angle. And as you can see, we only see a little bit in the middle and everything else to the sides uh, sort of fuzzes up and the acuity is terrible off to the side, even a little bit to the side. So we're imagining we see all this, but we don't actually see it. What's falling on our retina is uh, highly uh, um, uh, fuzzy anywhere except in the middle range of some number of degrees in the center. So where is this coming from? Where, why do we think we see all this? Well, that's a model that our brain makes. Um, <clears throat> the, um, what is this model for? Well, it's, it's probably important for, among other things, guiding eye movements, but it's also important to know what's likely present in the visual environment. That is um, based on prior eye movements and based on our knowledge of the world, we uh, can guess what's likely to be present off in the sides where we can't see. And it's important to have that knowledge present and, and available for us to guide things like eye movements or visual search um, in order to uh, uh, let us function properly in the environment. We wouldn't want to have to move, keep moving our eyes to figure out every time what is over here. It's, we can guess pretty well what's likely to be over there, and that's what our brain does for us, and what our model of the visual environment. And it becomes conscious because it's so prevalent and, and, uh, and uh, available. Um, so it, so it's not useful to perceive what actual stimulation falls on the retina. What is useful is to perceive what's likely there in the real environment. And that's what's useful for survival and for actions. Well, here's an example of um, a production of where visual, what visual <coughs> perception does for us consciously um, in perceiving what's actually there and not what we see. This is Ed Adelson's uh, checkerboard. The uh, squares that are labeled A and B look like they're different to us 
because we know it's a checkerboard, perhaps, and, other, and we know about shading. It looks like they're of different shades. One looks light and one looks dark. But if you actually would superimpose the two, which some videos do, you can see that they're actually of identical brightness. It's very hard for us to see that. In fact, it's hard to imagine <laughs> that, in fact, the, shade, the contrast shades of the A and B regions are identical. You can't, we can't see it. We uh, can't make ourselves see it. But it's, in fact, the case. Um, <clears throat> so, we're, so what our visual system does is form a model of what ought to be there in the real environment, not what's falling on our retina. Um, and we don't, perceive, we don't perceive everything consciously. Uh, for example, you could imagine it would be useful to uh, imagine seeing what's behind us rather than what's forward in our field of view. Well, we don't somehow consciously have a, <laughs> a scene behind us that was part of our um, conscious perception. But it's not that what's behind us is not, do we have some knowledge about what's behind us? I know that if I step backwards, I'm not going to fall off a cliff. I, I have, I, it's, not, it's not knowledge that's uh, veridical enough or strong enough that it's part of my perception consciously but I have a lot of knowledge about what's behind me. And I know there's a wall back there and I shouldn't walk too far and so on. Um, this is not great, it's not perfect knowledge, of course, as all this uh, inference is imperfect. Um, there's, um, even though I know that I can step backwards and so on and won't fall off a cliff, uh, there's been something like, I don't know, 500 or so people that have fallen off cliffs taking selfies. <laughs> As they, when they're at the Grand Canyon and other such places, um, I don't, it was sort of a demonstration that this knowledge of what's behind one sometimes is not very accurate. Um, oh, here's one more example of the um, tabletops. Now, if you look at this picture of the two tabletops, they do look like they're the same shape in 2D. It's almost impossible to see the actual, I don't know if I can freeze it, but those two don't look the same shape, but they are. This is just one more example of uh, the fact that we're interpreting what falls on our retina in terms of a 3D world, because it's useful to do so. And that, okay. Okay, so the models that our brain constructs are often causal, as when we interpret, interpret a verbal or text description by simulating an action scene in a, an imagined environment, for example, a steel ball falling onto a glass surface, causing breakage. Uh, the propensity for constructing causal models often produces mistakes. Um, there's a tendency, we have such a strong tendency to make causal models for everything that we have a tendency to interpret correlations as causations. And scientists themselves fall into this trap pretty routinely as we discover as reviewers when we um, review submissions to journals and discover that uh, sci other scientists are claiming causal mechanisms for a um, variety of effects that are found, when in fact they're representing correlations and we can think of other causes that the scientists did not think of. Um, <clears throat> So we have, as humans have this tremendous tendency to form these causal models and do so all the time for virtually everything. And Rebecca Sachs last night uh, showed us examples of the way we um, form causal models of other agents and what they're thinking and what they're intending. <coughs> uh, <coughs> <memory coughs> excuse me. Memory is also a matter of modeling. So what we think we remember is a construction based on some evidence, some actual uh, memory that our neural systems provide, and uh, is based on inference about, um, about what likely had happened that we're trying to remember. Um, so there's lots of examples of how this works. Um, <clears throat> Beth Loftus has provided many convincing demonstrations of the malleability of memory, um, <clears throat> its alterations over time and the fact that false memories that uh, seem real can be implanted by uh, various suggestions that uh, happen after the original event. <clears throat> and the, the fact that memory for events is a process of inference and construction has been shown in many ways. And uh, 
One of the demonstrations that's very nice was work by Mark Stivers, who's sitting over there, and Pernell Hemmer, who uh, showed that uh, what we think of is in, in a scene, for example, in a kitchen scene, is what ought to have been there based on our prior knowledge, not necessarily what's actually present in the scene. So memory is, again, a matter of forming a model, and a mental model, and a simulation of what likely is uh, in our memory. <coughs> Excuse me. So I could go on in this vein for a long time, but the point is clear. The world we inhabit is almost infinitely complex. The raw information received by our imperfect and limited sense, senses is bewilderingly complex and chaotic and incomplete. And to make sense of this information, and produce understanding and something that's useful for operating in the real world, we construct models of the environment that make sense of this information. We infer real or imaginary world scenarios. Imaginary, for example, if we're reading a fantasy novel or something, but it's nonetheless, it's a simulation of an imagined real world scenario, or a scenario anyway, involving our bodies, our environment, our actions, our minds, the roles of other agents in their minds and bodies and actions. And these models uh, form during early uh, development. We heard some of that from the talk last night. And they come to include every aspect of human cognition and behavior. They range from low-level perceptual descriptions, sometimes conscious, to high-level causal inferences, things like the failure of a marriage or the intent of another person holding a gun. and. Um, they range from the concrete to the very abstract, like in high-level mathematics. So one very early uh, example of something that we, a model that we can form that we can't imagine, but we can form it anyway with some kind of abstract thought, this is one example that um, I uh, was struck by early in my career at Stanford when, as a graduate student. There are an infinity of rational numbers, fractions, between zero and one, as close together as you can pack them infinitely close together. Fractions like 2 thirds and 373 over 982 and so on. And these are infinitely close together and packed everywhere between 0 and 1 because they're all possible fractions. Yet we learn in the first course in real analysis I learned that you can place intervals of finite size around every one of these fractions. So imagine a little interval of some size that's placed around every one of these fractions of these infinite fractions and they're of finite width, okay? And the sum of the lengths of all those intervals can add up to anything way smaller than one, as arbitrarily small as you like. So if you can visualize this, that would be terrific. You can visualize that these infinite fractions are packed every between zero and one. You can put little intervals around every one, and the sum of all the lengths of those intervals can add up to like 0.01. Well, if you can imagine this, you're doing better than I can. The, uh, the probabilist who taught the course at Stanford said he'd been working in deep probability theory and measure theory for 30 years and couldn't imagine how this could be. <laughs> so it's, this is just an example of the fact that we can form very abstract models of things we can't even visualize or imagine. OK, so all of this is somehow constructed by our brains. And the question is, how? Well. In the last five decades especially, neuroscience has made enormous advances. A vast array of new measurement techniques has produced startling advances in structural neuroanatomy, uh, maps and networks by which neurons are connected to each other, and functional anatomy, the neuroanatomy, which regions and networks are correlated with observed cognition and behavior. We saw some nice examples of this last night in last night's talk. Um, <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> there's something missing, of course, despite all these advances in um, neuroanatomy and functional neuroanatomy. Uh, it doesn't really tell us how the brain produces the models that we've been talking about. Uh, we know where and, and what groups of neurons are, re are, do are related or correlated with the behavior we observe. but. Uh, there still is a big gap in understanding what's going on. And uh, this has often been noted. Um, analogies have been made with imagined attempts to understand the workings of a cell phone by structural and functional imaging or the like, or perhaps 
dismantling his cell phone and examining all the connections that are inside. So we've had a variety of uh, papers, interesting papers, talking about trying to infer how a cell phone works from understanding the pieces. And uh, I think the point is uh, pretty clear that uh, we're missing something important um, <clears throat> when um, we just know which things are connected to where and where they are. When there's quite a bit that we don't understand about a cell phone and how it works, um, like the algorithms that are operating the system and the uh, access to the World Wide Web and a whole host of other things that we need to really understand to know what a cell phone is actually doing. Well, no one should be surprised that our psychological, neuro, and cognitive sciences have a long way to go to connect mind, brain and mind. <clears throat> but we're starting to see a number of promising attempts to bridge this gap. And in important cases, um, uh, let's say uh, we, people are doing this by viewing the brain as a model builder and in effect seeing the brain as a scientist trying to infer what's uh, there in the environment. And that's sort of the prime motivation for this sacral colloquium. And we've collected a uh, group of uh, outstanding scientists, researchers, theorists who are attacking this problem in a variety of interesting ways. And um, I'll be looking forward to the uh, talks as much as you are. And let me say that um, there'll be, uh, after every talk, uh, questions. And there's two ways to ask questions. One way is to go to these microphones that are on each side of the auditorium, but some of you are in the middle of the um, uh, auditorium and I find it hard to scramble over other people. So what we have is a, uh, this um, interesting microphone. And um, what we'll do, I don't know who will do it, is when somebody wants to ask a question here in the middle, instead of having to go to the thing, we just sort of toss it in the air and somebody picks it up who wants the, the question, and you can hold it if you like. And that one, <laughs> and that one will be, uh, you can use to ask your questions. So at this point, uh, I know I'm a little short. I mean, I, I didn't talk as long, you know, my full time. But I thought I'd throw this open, especially for the other speakers and organizers, if they have anything to add or say to any of this, or any questions that you want to ask before we turn to the actual um, uh, technical talks in the symposium. So I'll just open it up for uh, uh, questions or comments. 